3, 2. Hola, buenos días y buenas tardes para los que estén en España, los que estén en, en México. Y estamos en este congreso telemático de la Sociedad Matemática Española, la Sociedad Mexicana. Y entonces estamos en esta sesión especial. Que le hemos puesto un nombre mmm, muy largo. ¿eh? Le hemos puesto un nombre de análisis armónico, aplicaciones cosi conformes y ecuaciones integrales parciales. Ya casi podríamos poner puesto ya análisis matemático, ¿no? Para, para contenerlo todo. Pero bueno, estamos aquí, estamos muy contentos y satisfechos de las contribuciones que han hecho, han hecho anteriormente los seis conferenciantes que han hecho las charlas cortas. Y ahora en esta charla en vivo vamos a, a tener la contribución de Joan Mateo y Joan Verdera, que son profesores de la Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona, y nos van a contar también en cómo en su trabajo ellos han conectado las integrales singulares y las ecuaciones lineales parciales, que precisamente es el, el título de su, de su charla, de su exposición. Entonces, eh, Víctor, cuando tú te parezca bien, ya puedes eh, emitir el vídeo y nos vemos cuando acabe el vídeo. Hasta pronto. Vale. Hola. Agradezco a los organizadores la invitación uh, para hablar en este congreso. Y este que veis aquí es el lazo amarillo por la libertad de los uh, presos políticos catalanes que han sido injustamente encarcelados, tal como ha establecido, ha concluido el Comité uh, de Detenciones Arbitrarias uh, de la ONU y uh, por los cuales ha pedido la uh, libertad inmediata, así como amnistía internacional. El juicio estuvo lleno de irregularidades y de violaciones incluso de derechos humanos, lo cual ha dejado el Estado de Derecho español en una situación muy grave de debilidad. ¿Eh? Esperemos que todo esto se arregle pronto. Muy bien, pues empezamos. Voy a cambiar al inglés de manera que la conferencia pueda, pueda ser seguida por un público, digamos, más amplio. Ok, then we will speak about the relationships between uh, singular integrals of Calderon Simon type uh, and PDs. Just in a little uh, part of this big. Uh, area in which we have been uh, working. So, to start, let me recall the simplest uh, singular integral, which is the Hilbert transform. Hilbert transform of a function f. You can think that f is a function as smooth as you wish. For example, to avoid problems of definition, let's assume that it's uh, C infinity with compact support in the whole line. Then the, uh, the, the Hilbert transform is the principal value of convolution with the kernel 1 over x. The point x, if you wish. And this uh, principal value means simply that you take a limit when epsilon goes to zero, when epsilon goes to zero, of, since the kernel, you see, look at the kernel, the kernel, we are in the line, so the kernel is really at the limit of integrability, integrability. in fact, it is not locally integrable, the singularity at zero is too strong for integrability, so the kernel is not locally integrable, so this convolution must be defined uh, carefully. Then the, the way to do that is to delete a little interval around the point x 
you delete this little, inter this little interval, then the, uh, you have killed the singularity, the 1 over pi, if you wish, you put it here, outside. You have killed the singularity. Now there is no singularity. The function f is very good. Then for each epsilon, this truncated integral uh, as a meaning, as, uh, as a perfect meaning, as an absolutely uh, convergent integral, and then you take a limit when epsilon goes to zero. So that's the meaning of the, of the principal value. Now, the Hilbert transform arises, for example, it, it has, uh, there is no um, close relation between the Hilbert transform and PDEs because this is a one-dimensional object, but um, there is a relation with harmonic functions in the upper half plane. So you take, the relation is this, so this is the line, and then we have the upper half plane, then you take the function f here in the line, you take the Poisson integral, u is the Poisson integral of f, then this u is a harmonic function on the half space, on the upper half space, then you take the harmonic conjugate, the harmonic conjugate is a function, harmony, harmonic, such that u plus i u tilde is real, real function, such that u plus i u tilde is holomorphic in the half space, in the half space, in the upper half space. Uh, of course, there is here uh, an, indeterm an, an indeterminacy because uh, the function u tilde is um, determined modulo a constant, but you normalize in some way, and then one, once you have normalized, you take limit when, when uh, if you wish, vertical limit on, on the line, on a point on the line, and you get a function which is called f tilde, the conjugate of f. The conjugate of f is this convolution here, we, we have written. The conjugate of f is exactly the Hilbert transform of f. So that's the relation between the Hilbert transform and the theory of harmonic functions in the upper half plane. Now, let's go to a more interesting uh, topic, which is, which is, which is uh, ellipticity. There is a clear, very clear relation of Calderon -Simon, singular integrals of calderon simon type and ellipt ellipticity. The relation is this. So let's start in the plane, for example. Start in the plane, we take a function as before. We take a test function in the plane. Then we know that this function is the convolution of its Laplacian with the fundamental solution of the Laplacian. So we have this identity here. Then um, let's look at what happens when we uh, take derivatives in this identity. So when you take a first order derivative with respect to the variable x, for example, then you get the following. You get some point z. z is the complex variable which we write x plus i y. When you take the derivative of the kernel of log mod z with respect to the first variable, you get the following expression. You get 1 over x mod z squared, and then convolution Laplacian phi. So what I have done is simply, I have taken derivative here in the kernel with respect to the x variable. Of course, by the theorem of differentiation and the integral sign, this is correct, provided the kernel is locally integrable at least. And this is what happens here. We are in the plane. This kernel is locally integrable because when you take absolute value, you may estimate the numerator by mod z, then you in fact get, uh, you get an upper uh, bound of the form 1 over mod z. But 1 over mod z in the plane is integrable. 
is different from what happens in the line, right? In the line you have one dimension less, and the kernel 1 over x is uh, too singular. Instead, 1 over z, this kind of kernel, say, 1 over mod z even, is a local interval in the plane. This you can see just by taking, you integrate on a ball centered at 0 with respect to area, to two dimensional Lebesgue measure, then you make a uh, you change to polar coordinates and you get this is just to show you that the kernel is local integral you get this then the singularity uh, disappears and you get a you get a finite integral to pi r right so when you take a first derivative in the logarithmic kernel, you are okay. Now I will write the kernel you get when you take a y derivative is exactly the same we have obtained here, we have obtained here, with x replaced by y, of course, because the, the roles of x and y can be interchanged. So, the derivative of phi with respect to y is again this uh, convolution. Convolution again with the locally integral, convolution of the Laplacian with the locally integral kernel. Now, what happens if we take another derivative? Let's take a second derivative. The computation is easier if we take the crossed the cross, um, the cross derivative, say. If we take the derivative with respect to y or the derivative with respect to x here. So let's take derivative with respect to y first, with respect to x first, and then with respect to y of phi, some point z. Then uh, the temptation is to take the derivative in the, uh, of the kernel. You can do this, and what you get is minus 1 over pi xy mod z 4 to the power 4, right? You don't, you don't take the derivative in x, you take the derivative in, in, in the denominator and you get that expression. And then here you have convolution with Laplacian phi. But now observe that this kernel is exactly at the limit of integrability, it's not locally integrable. Because when you put absolute value here, in the numerator, and you try to estimate by mod z two times, you get 1 over mod z square. And 1 over mod z square in the plane is not integrable because here you would get an r square in the denominator, you would finally get 1 over r, which is not integrable in the line. Okay, so when you take a second derivative, the kernel you get is not locally integrable, then this object has to be understood, in fact it is, a principal value. So here you have principal value, let, let me put it here, principal value, which means that you have to delete a ball around the point you are computing this second derivative, around the point z, take the point z, and you take a ball around z, radius epsilon, you make this uh, uh, derivation, this in integration, you take the derivative of the kernel outside this ball, now you can do it because uh, there is no singularity, and then you have to observe, in applying green stocks, you apply green stocks, and then you observe that the limit when epsilon tends to zero exists, exists and this is precisely what we have denoted by principal value here. So there is um, this um, added difficulty that when you uh, take a second derivative, you get kernels which are not locally integrable. When you take the two derivatives with respect to the same, vari uh, to the same variable, for example, with respect to x, when you take derivative with respect to x two times, there is a new phenomenon that appears, is that when you make this game of deleting a ball and um, 
making applying green stocks in the complement of that ball, you get uh, an extra term which gives you, in fact, a, a delta Dirac, a delta Dirac at the point Z. And then here you obtain, when you do the computation uh, carefully, you obtain this extra term, one half of Laplacian, and then what you would obtain just taking derivative formally in the kernel. So you obtain um, plus 1 over pi. Then here, I'm going to write the kernel you, you obtain. The kernel you obtain is this. Then principal value, of course. Principal value, convolution, Laplacian phi, the point Z. So the novelty here is that besides what you get when you take derivatives inside the kernel, you also get a, a Dirac delta, say, at the point. You get just the Laplacian, uh, one half of the Laplacian in front, one half in front of the Laplacian. And when you take derivative with respect to y, you get exactly the same thing, but with uh, x replaced by y. So your kernel now is this. And I'm going to replace here uh, x by, by y and then take convolution uh, with Laplacian. So this uh, principal value, uh, so you have these really elegant formulas and this um, principal value integrals that have appeared here with these special kernels are uh, basic examples of uh, singular integrals of calderon zeeman type. So now I am going to write the general form of a calderon zeeman uh, singular integral of first generation, say, the first that, uh, class that Calderon and Zygmunt uh, studied in their famous paper of 1952. And then we will rem remember the, the main uh, result of Calderon and Simon in that article. And then we will apply this to what I said before, to electricity, say, to the Laplacian, in fact. So, so how are these first generation calderon simon integrals. They are operators generation calderon simon integrals. They are um, operators of this type. So let me write the operator. Tfx is principal value. There is a convolution. The convolution is with a kernel of that type. Okay, so the kernel is of this form, is omega x over mod x to the n. We are in Rn now. Okay, so you, we have switched to higher dimensions. Convolution f, if you wish, at the point x. We already know what is the principal value. You delete a little ball around x. You make the integral of the convolution outside the, that ball, and then you take limit when epsilon uh, goes to zero. So what is omega? Omega is a function. Omega is homogeneous of degree zero. So the kernel, if you wish, the kernel when you divide by mod x to the n is homogeneous of degree minus n and the dimension is uh, smooth outside the origin, which is its only singularity, okay, the origin. And when you restrict that function to the uh, unit sphere, you get a function which is integrable, of course, because it's C1, it's continuous, but with zero integral. This is the cancellation property of the kernel. So
So in the examples we, ha we have obtained here, in these examples, the, I am going to write now omega for these kernels. And you will see that it's not clear a priori that they have zero integral on the unit sphere. For the Hilbert uh, transform it is, right? Because the Hilbert transform, the kernel, you can write in this form omega over mod x. You can write in this form. You can write sine x over mod x. And of course, the sine as a zero integral on the, uh, on the extremes of the, uni of the interval minus 1, 1. So plus 1, minus 1 clearly is, is zero. But in here, the omega, for example, for this first uh, uh, kernel, the omega is this. The omega is, you make the kernel homogeneous of degree zero. So you have to divide by mod uh, z square and separate here in the denominator, if you, if you wish, mod z square. So you are in this, uh, in this form. So you get a kernel of this form. And then in the, in the sphere, Observe that in the sphere, this is 1 minus 2x squared. Excuse me. That's all. The, the denominator is 0. So you get 1 minus 2x squared. And then uh, this integral is, in fact, you can check it on the unit sphere. This in, this, the integral of this function is 0. Although it's not clear because the kernel here is not odd, say. If the kernel uh, was odd, like here, the uh, zero integral on the sphere would be clear, but here the kernel is even. And it's not so clear that uh, the integral on the sphere is on the sphere is zero. Same thing with uh, the kernel I erased for the mixed derivatives, right? Maybe in that case, for the mixed derivatives, what you obtain is xy over mod z square, which is xy on the unit on the unit circumference, and this clearly a zero integral on the unit circumference. So the kernels we obtain are of this type, are precisely of this type. There is some homogeneity, the kernel is homogeneous of the green minus n, the kernel is a some smoothness of the origin. And there is this cancellation property here. And then what Calderon and Zygmunt proved by uh, real variable methods in 1952 were the classical inequalities of what have become classical inequalities in calderon Zygmunt theory, which are the following. So what they prove is that you have an LP inequality if p is less than a constant, depending only on p, n of the of dimension, of course. Norm f p, p is between 1 and infinity. And for L infinity, it's known that the inequality is not true, but there is, uh, um, but there is a replacement this is an alternative inequality, which is the BMOL infinity inequality. BMO is less than constant times norm F infinity. The, the L infinity inequality is not true, so let me just uh, say a few words about this. The L infinity is not true, for example, already for the Hilbert transform. Remember, when you compute the Hilbert transform of the interval minus 1, 1, you make, you write the convolution, you write the kernel, and you just integrate. You just find the primitive of the kernel and just integrate between minus 1 and 1. You get this. You get 1 over pi log mod z, mod z plus 1 divided mod x minus 1, mod x plus 1, mod, mod x minus 1. And this function has singularities at the points, at the extremes of the interval, at minus 1 and at 1, clearly. Okay? So it's not 
a bounded function. It has the maximal singularity that, that a BMO function may have, which is a logarithmic singularity. I'm not going to insist anymore about BMO um, because it's not the point. Just the important thing is that these operators fail to send L infinity into L infinity. And this causes a lot of trouble, right? And is the reason why many problems are difficult. Many problems become difficult. Now, what is the application of the LP inequality to ellipticity? The application is that <coughs> because the kernels we have seen in the plane that make the, the transition between uh, second order derivatives and Laplacian are of this type, then um, we obtain these inequalities. Just the derivative with respect to x and y on phi of a, test, of a test function in Lp of R2 is less than constant times the Lp norm of Laplacian in R2. Sa the same thing for the other derivatives. Remember that the other derivatives have a delta term, but this delta term is the, is the Laplacian. Okay? It was on one half of the Laplacian, which is okay because we, are, we, are, uh, we want to estimate in terms of precisely of the Laplacian. And the same thing for the other derivative with respect, second order derivative with respect to the other variable. So you see, um, the Laplacian, the LP norm of the Laplacian controls the LP norms of any second order derivative. Then when you have a function, to conclude that the function is in the Sobolev space is enough to know that the function is in LP, that the Laplacian is in LP. This implies that phi is in W as a second derivatives in LP on the plane. There are similar results in Rn. I haven't, I haven't mentioned them, uh, but um, it's not difficult to it's not difficult to uh, re reproduce the computations we have done and to uh, conclude that these inequalities are true also in Rn. Because what happens in Rn? In Rn, uh, the function, the test function is the uh, fundamental solution of the Laplacian in Rn, which, is, which has this form, Cn is some constant. So in the plane for n, uh, for n equals 2, here appear the logarithm. In dimensions higher than 2, uh, you, you get a kernel of this type, a risk kernel of this type. And then when you take two derivatives, for example, with respect to i and j, what you get he here, finally, is something like this. You get x i x j mod x n plus 2 convolution Laplacian. Again, when, the, when i equals j, there is the delta term which we have uh, pointed out before. But observe that this is again a kernel of the type we have been looking, is the first generation calderon simon kernel. On the sphere, you, you get xi, xj, and the interval of xi, xj on the sphere is zero. So you get again these inequalities here. So any second order derivative of uh, phi, the LP norm, of any second order derivative is controlled by the LP norm of the Laplacian, which is a form of uh, expressing uh, ellipticity. It's a consequence of ellipticity, in fact. So again, to conclude that the function is in the Sobolev space of order 2 and index p in Rn, you only have to check that the Laplacian is in LP of Rn. Now, <coughs> uh, with uh, in my work with uh, Matteo and Orovic, uh, what we found at some, some point is a result which was, which was quite surprising for us, and that then 
turn out to be very well known by people who work in uh, fluids, in fluid dynamics. The result is the following. So you have a domain, so take a domain D with um, smooth boundary, class say C1 plus gamma, a little bit more than C1. Gamma, if you wish, is an index between 0 and 1. Then, when you take a first generation Calderon Simon operator of the characteristic function of the domain, you get uh, a bounded function. So this norm, so instead of writing this, let me write that this function is in L infinity. In fact, it's a function in all LP spaces, right? Because the characteristic D is, is bounded, say, the domain D is bounded. So the characteristic function is in L infinity, but so it's in, it's, in, it's in LP. So this function is in all LP spaces, but in fact, is, in, is, is a bounded function. Provided, so here there is provided a t is even, which means the kernel is even. We have uh, made the computation here, which shows that such a result is not true uh, for odd calderon simon operators. Okay? It fails for the domain, which is the uh, open interval minus 1, 1. As we have seen, there are singularities. But if the kernel is even, then this function is bounded. This is quite simple to prove. It's not difficult to prove. So now, now I am going to finish. So John Matteo is going to continue. So let me erase the, the blackboard for, for him. But while I, I am, well, while I am erasing, let me say that the proof of this result is quite simple. It's not difficult. It's just a property. It follows from the property that an even kernel, the integral of an even kernel on half a sphere, not, not, well, the whole, uh, not only on the whole sphere, unit uh, sphere, just on half a sphere is zero. Then using this uh, fact, this observation, and by a simple argument, you can conclude that the t, the characteristic function of a smooth domain, is a bounded function. So now, um, we have taken a few more minutes, but I give the microphone to John Matteo immediately. And he will go on. He will explain you We'll explain you how this result appears. Okay. 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 Well, <coughs> thanks again to the organizers for for the invitation. Uh, I will talk about uh, the relationship between singular integral and fluid mechanics, more precisely, the Euler equations. We will start with 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 Euler equation in higher dimension. Uh, Euler, in 1755, proposed an equation for a velocity field of an incompressible and inviscid fluid, and this is the equation, dTb plus P gradient B equal minus gradient P, divergence of B equals zero, and then some initial condition, Bx0, well, B0x. This is the so-called Euler equation. It is in higher dimension. <coughs> and and in, for, for this equation, the unknowns are the velocity and the pressure. The velocity is a vector field, so the unknowns are V1, Vn, and the pressure is an escalar function. Uh, here, uh, this quantity, V gradient, means V1, D1, plus V2, D2, plus and the pressure is related with the velocity and the pressure is related with the velocity by the equation Laplacian of P equal minus divergence 
of B gradient B. Okay, so our, our, our question, the first question is try to, to solve this, this equation. This is a PDE, and when you, when, when you have a PDE, the, the first problem, the first question is to know if for this PDE you have a theorem of existence and uniqueness, a local theorem of existence and uniqueness. And it was solved by Cato, and he proved existence and uniqueness if the initial data is in a is an smooth, is in, in a smooth space. So if we, ho, if we assume that S is bigger than D over 2 plus 1, then uh, <coughs> and V0 belongs to the whole F space HS, it means that we have S derivatives in L2, then there exists th then there exists a solution B belongs to continuous in an interval 0 t star and the values and is in this solid space. It was solved by, by Cato. Mm -hmm. And uh, th this is only a, a, local, a local thing. The, the same kind of problem has been considered by several authors for different spaces or functions and uh, some results are, have been obtained for spaces that for some spaces which are contained in C1. It's important that the spaces are contained in C1. And then another important thing is that for D equal to 2, T star is, uh, is equal to infinity, and for D bigger than 3, this is not known. In fact, this is a very difficult problem, and is one of the problems of the Clay Institute. Okay, so, so we, we, we have this, this, this equation, and then another, another object that is interesting to consider is the vorticity. The, the vorticity, with a note like this quantity, is the curl of the velocity, and if we are in the plane, this is d1v2 minus d2v1. No? The vorticity is a scalar function, and, and the vorticity in some sense describes the tendency of something to rotate, the local tendency of something to rotate. And if we take this equation, the Euler equation, and in, in, this, in the Euler equation, or in the Euler system, if you prefer, uh, and, and, and for this equation, we write the, the, we take the vorticity, then we get the, the, the vorticity equation, and it's dt omega plus b gradient omega equals zero, because the, the curl of the, of the gradient is zero. And then we also will have another two conditions. The other one is that the velocity is related with the velocity, with the vorticity, i over two omega. And the third one is an initial condition, an, in, an initial vorticity, omega zero x. If, if we take this equation, we get this equation only for the case n equal to 2. In higher dimension, uh, we, this is not true. And, uh, and here, when we take the vorticity, in higher dimension, we have an extra term. No? And the situation is much, much more involved. <coughs> so, so it means that, that if, if I can get the, the velocity, then uh, with this uh, taking the curve, you, take the, you get the vorticity, but if you have the vorticity taking this, this integral, then I will talk a little, a little bit more about that, then I can also recover the, the velocity. And so we, we have these two equations, the, the vorticity equation and the Euler equation, and in the plane this, this equation coincides. No? <clears throat> okay, on, on, on the other hand, you have a vector field, if we have a vector field, we can try to, to try to study the trajectories of the particles of our fluid. No? And the trajectories of the particle are given by the equation dz of t, alpha t, the velocity of zeta, alpha t, t, and the initial condition zeta alpha zero equals zeta. No? This, this equation describes the trajectories of the particles. No? And, and if we have the trajectories of the particle and we look at this equation, we can see that this equation tells us that the derivative in time of the vorticity along the trajectories 
is zero. So it means that, that the vorticity along the trajectory is constant. Mm, here is, is an easy computation. You take the derivative in t, this is dt omega, the first one, and then here you take the gradient omega, and then you take the derivative in z respect to t, and this is the velocity. No? So in the plane, we, 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 we can think in this way, and so it means that the, that the vorticity is constant along the trajectories. No? So <coughs> it means that, 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 for instance, if we take a, an special case, that is the case when omega zero is the characteristic function of a domain, this is the so-called vortex patch, then this, this thing tell us that if I have a domain d not, and I mean here the velocity here is one and here is zero, then the evolution of this domain of this domain, this is zeta alpha zeta t or zeta alpha t, you have another domain dt. And here the vorticity is one and here the vorticity is zero. <coughs> the, the, the one of the, the points is that perhaps the, the another thing is <coughs> using Goyler equation, this is incompressible fluid, so it means that, that the area the, the area of the zero is the same that the area of the naught. But perhaps the, the, the boundary of the zero is very nice and the boundary of dt is, is very complicated. And so, <coughs> uh, using this, this argument and this thing, uh, Maidas in the 80 proposed the, the following conjecture. There exists a smooth domain <coughs> which becomes which boundary becomes infinite length in finite time. So the, the Maida conjecture tell us that here we can have a domain, very good domain, and, and, and then at and then at and then at, at finite time uh, we, we will get uh, infinite length. In fact, uh, he, he obtained this conjecture or he proposed his conjecture from some numerics, some numerics, but the numerics are numeric, and the idea wa what it, that is, is that the, the length of the, wall, of the boundary was, was uh, larger and larger and larger at any time. But in 93, Chemin disproved in some sense, in some sense, partially, in 93, this proved the, the Midas, the, the Midas uh, conjecture. And he proved that, that uh, if the boundary of D0 is C1 plus gamma, then the boundary of DT is C1 plus gamma for any gamma between zero and one. It was the, the, the result of Chemin. This result is quite, quite nice and complicated, the proof, but it was the idea. And, and, and to obtain his result, and, and, and for this reason, so my conjecture is, could be true still, no? Perhaps you can get a domain with the boundary uh, C1, such that uh, in, in finite time uh, will be uh, in finite length. Eh? Could be no, but but the boundary could be C one, not C not C one plus alpha. Okay, <coughs> and then uh, to 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 get or to obtain the Chemin result, one of the main points to to get it is to control or to take uh, 
bound, bounds on the gradient of the velocity. No? The point is, is to control the infinity of the gradient of the velocity. No? I will try to explain a little bit why. No? If, 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 if we take the, the velocity in the plane and <coughs> we have that the, the two times the d of the velocity is the divergence of b plus e the curve of b. The curve of b. And using that we are in Euler, in Euler equation, the divergence of b is zero, and so the curve of b is the vorticity omega, so this is 2 dv equal e omega. <coughs> and, and then using that the fundamental solution of the dv is 1 over pz bar, it implies that b is 1, one, one over pz bar times y over 2 omega. In this case, this is not a singular integral still, no? because this kernel is local, inter this kernel is local integral. And uh, it, we can be write it in this way, p zeta t is the integral of omega <coughs> ct uh, z bar minus z bar d a xc is, is this quantity. One over pi. One over pi. One over pi. And this is a very, this is well known for people in fluid mechanics because this the so-called piot savar law. And you can see explicitly how, how you can recover the velocity from the, from the vorticity. Okay, but, but, but for if, if we come back again to the Chemin result, and in general we want to get some results on, on ODEs and on PDEs, it's important to control the gradient of the velocity, because when I have the equation of the trajectory, if the z respect to t is the velocity at the point z, then uh, one condition that is needed is that the vector field should be ellipsis, no? and the vector field should be ellipsis is equivalent to, to the gradient of the velocity uh, should be bounded. No? So here, here it will be interesting to control or to talk about the gradient of the velocity. And here if we want to, 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 to take the gradient of the velocity, we can, take d, we can take dx dy or d d bar. And we prefer to work with d d bar. No? And if we stay with d, d of b is uh, <coughs> i2 over omega, i2 over omega, this is clearly, this is uh, uh, bounded function, but but if we take d bar of b, d bar, d bar of b is mi minus one over pi z square i over two omega, and here we need to put the principal value. We need to put the principal value of this quantity, as Joan explained us uh, before. No? And so here we have that the, the d bar of b. Is a, is a singular integral. It's a singular, it's a singular, it's a singular inter, in, integral operator. And uh, if, if, if omega, for instance, if omega is the characteristic function of a domain D, then uh, by the last result that uh, Joan explained to us, this quantity is bounded. Uh, then D bar of B is bounded. And it's clear bounded if omega is, is a vortex patch. So in, in, in some sense, in some sense, is much more involved in, in, in the Chemin result, he, he, all, he also uses this argument that if you have a domain uh, as your, dom your domain is C1 plus alpha, then some even Calderon Sigmund, this one, because this is an even Cal Calderon Sigmund, is, is bounded. Is bounded. And, and so we, we arrive to the same result than, than Chemin uh, 15 years later or something like that. But this is, a, this is the point that, that when Chemin and, and, and us meet at, at some point. Then uh, we are also interested, or we also were interested in the so-called B states. B states is a special case of uh, vortex patch. B states are, are, are vortex patch that, that rotates with constant angular velocity. 
This is the, the idea of a B state. Board patch. That rotates with constant angular velocity. It means that, that if I have a domain D0, DT is E T A D0. It's, it's a rotation of the original one at angular velo at, at fixed angular velocity. Well, this is the definition of a B state, and when we are at this point, uh, the question is the following. But this kind of object exists. The, 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 there exists a domain D0 such that if I have the vortex patch associated to D0, the evolution of this vortex patch is, is a rotation. And the answer is yes. And the first example was given by Rankin in the 19th century, and he proved that any disk rotates around the center of mass. If center of mass. So it means that if here you have a disk and you have a fluid inside and outside you have nothing and, and then all the time you are in the fluid eh? and, and you and you look at it and all the time you 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 can see the same uh, the same disk but if you take a a, a particle in the in the fluid and you pay, you paint this particle of pink color then this pa this particle is rotating the particles inside are rotating but all the fluid is all the time inside the disk this is the the the, the, the example of Rankin and some year, some year later i think at, at the end of the 19th century is, is an example of Kirchhoff and Kirchhoff uh, proved that ellipse are B states ellipse are B states of angular velocity uh, we denote the angular velocity by A uh, angular velocity A equal AB divided A plus B square. So it means that if you have this ellipse <coughs> and this is A, the, the, <coughs> the, this semi-axis, and B is the other semi-axis, so these objects are rotating and the particle inside, of course, are rotating. One interesting thing is when B goes to zero, A tends to zero, and it tends to, to, to the interval, and in this situation that you have minus A, A, here you have an steady solution. In this case, you have an steady solution. Here it's a little bit more complicated because you have to, to, to define in, in, a, in a better way the thing, but this is the thing, this is the point, no? Sí. And <coughs> And so, for, 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 for the, the result was, was obtained at the end of the 19th century, and then the, 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 the question for some mathematicians or physicists was, uh, can we get, can we obtain more objects like that, more BS states? And a lot of work has been done, and a lot of results have been obtained from the numerical point of view. And, and numerical, numeric, they have a lot of pictures of examples of domains uh, that they were uh, rotating vortex patches, that it be states. But there were no, no precise proof of this fact. And uh, recently we proved with a uh, thick MIDI from Rennes and from, with Joan I'm a, I'm a, and myself that there exists for any M, 
m bigger than 2, there exists a family of m folds which are b states. m fold means that uh, M, M fold means that if, if I have a rotation of the of the set coincides with the set. No? This M, an M fold, if you take a, rota a rotation of the set and, and it coincides with the set. No? For instance, an ellipse is a two-fold. An ellipse is a two-fold. And so we prove that, that that for any M, for any M, we, we can get three folds that they are VST, we can get four folds that they are VST, and for any M we can get uh, this kind of do domains. Moreover, these domains, the boundary of the V-states, the boundary of uh, these V-states are C infinity, so they have very good boundaries, and uh, they are uh, they are also mm, convex. They are convex. You have a family of a smooth domain uh, satisfying this property. No, that they, they are VST, They rotate for any m for any m. Uh, the boundary is very nice, it's infinity, and they are uh, convex. And <coughs> only some 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 comments the the to prove this kind of result essentially we we, we use three kinds of tools one are tools in complex analysis co that is conformal mapping some are tools in harmonic analysis we use singular integral mm, singular integral on surf on corpse essentially a little bit different than this thing and the other thing is bifurcation theory and it's in this way we get the result and the, the, the last point to say is that when we finish with, with the result, here we were not very happy with this, and the idea, we thought that, that in fact, the boundary should be real analytic, and later on, uh, Diego Cordova uh, and Javier Gomez Serrano uh, proved that this, this boundary are real analytic. And And Castro proved that uh, the boundary of D are real analytic in a very nice paper. And I think I will stop here. Thank you very much. Muy bien, pues muchas gracias por, por vuestra charla. Um, Víctor, ¿se me, ¿se me oye? Sí, sí. Sí, vale, estupendo. Pues um, gracias a, a, a Joan Verdera y Joan Mateo por, por esta charla. Y ahora pasaríamos a hacer um, preguntas sobre esta charla. Pero también creo que podemos hacer ya también uh, comentarios sobre, más allá de esta charla también, ¿eh? sobre, las, sobre las sesiones estas cortas que hemos estado estos días eh, visionando por, por internet. Yo creo, bueno, si hay preguntas por el chat, haremos preguntas por el chat, pero creo sí. que en este momento ya podríamos eh, cerrar el, la retransmisión en, en YouTube y pasar todos en el Zoom. ¿no? ¿Te parece bien, Víctor? Sí, está bien. ¿Sí? pues ya la, 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 la retransmisión en, en YouTube la terminamos, esperamos...